Hello and welcome to lecture 13 of Foundations of Artificial Intelligence. Today we're going to be learning about building an expert system and we're going to learn a little bit about an expert system programming shell called Pyke. In our last lecture we went through some of the major components of an expert system including the knowledge base, the inference engine, other components such as the user interface, knowledge base editor, and explanation system. Then we looked at some other types of expert systems including fuzzy, frame-based, neuro, and neurofuzzy. We reviewed some of the major advantages and disadvantages of expert systems, and then we discussed shells, including briefly mentioning Pike, the shell we're going to be learning about at the end of this lecture. We're going to start today's lecture by learning about some of the development roles involved in a team that might be designing and building an expert system. Then we'll learn about two important parts of building an expert system, in particular knowledge acquisition and knowledge engineering. Then we'll move on to introducing Pike, our Python expert system programming shell. After introducing those basics, I'll walk you through two Pike examples, including a family-based expert system and a weather-based one. Recall from an earlier lecture, we talked about why we might want to develop or use expert systems to begin with. For instance, when human expertise is in short supply, expertise itself is expensive to develop or to hire, it can be hard to get a hold of experts in a hurry, and we can lose expertise due to people moving on to other jobs or death. The building of an expert system serves many functions, including documenting that expertise, reproducing it or making it available upon demand, and teaching and disseminating the information behind that expertise. And lastly, expert systems offer expertise in a way where you don't have to worry about an individual getting bored, tired, frustrated, or scared. First off, in choosing a problem that might benefit from the building of an expert system, it's important to be realistic about the costs involved and to ensure that the expense is justified given those expected benefits. Expert systems require iterative development, which is a large investment of time. However, the costs of building an expert system can be justified, especially when expertise is in short supply. Next, we want to ensure that choosing an expert system as a technique is appropriate to begin with. They'd likely not be very appropriate for problems requiring manual dexterity or physical skill, problems that require a lot of common sense knowledge, and problems that are solvable with simpler techniques, such as flowcharts encoded as a simple program, and spreadsheets. In other words, if simple methods work, don't bother looking for a more complex solution. Expert systems are likely appropriate when a problem requires highly specialized expertise, but at the same time, it would only take a human expert a shortish time to solve that problem, for example, an hour maximum. The reason for this is as problems get more and more complex, they might be a lot harder to transfer that knowledge into an automated expert system. And lastly, in deciding whether your problem is well suited to developing an expert system, you want to make sure that there are available and cooperative experts to help you build your system. Further, you might need to assemble a development team as well as example users to try out your expert system and see if it's user friendly. Obviously, these guidelines are more targeted towards larger scale and more sophisticated expert systems that might be used at the academic and industrial level. So in deciding whether building an expert system is a worthy investment, you'd want to start with a cost-benefit analysis and include considerations such as, can the problem be solved effectively by conventional programming? Is there a need or desire for an expert system? Is there at least one human expert willing to cooperate in its assembly? Can that expert explain the knowledge to a knowledge engineer? Can the knowledge engineer understand the expert? Is the problem solving knowledge mainly heuristic and uncertain? And are the time and monetary costs going to pay off? Now let's take a moment to look at the process of expert system building at a glance. Notably, your first attempt is unlikely to be perfectly successful. An expert generally finds it difficult to express exactly what knowledge and rules they use to solve a problem. Part of the reason for this is that a lot of knowledge comes from common sense or subconscious knowledge, which might seem obvious to the expert and so they might not bother mentioning it, even though ultimately it'll need to be explicitly captured in the knowledge base of the expert system. The first phase of expert system building is always knowledge acquisition. Here we want to gather or extract relevant knowledge. The next phase is knowledge engineering, where we want to build the expert system knowledge base based on the knowledge we've gathered. Next, it's time to develop an initial prototype, which will be shown to the expert. This gives the expert a chance to assess the expert system in terms of its performance and allows the expert to give feedback. This feedback will then be used to refine the knowledge base and refine its performance. So this process of developing an expert system is usually iterative, 
So starting from that prototype, the revision of the expert system follows an iterative process driven by feedback between the expert and the end users of the system. Now we'll talk about expert system development roles. We'll go back to our schematic of an expert system. And as we've mentioned, one of the most important people involved in building it is a domain expert. The domain expert works with a knowledge engineer to facilitate the process of knowledge acquisition. From here, the knowledge engineer can work with a software developer or a coder who will actually take the engineered knowledge and turn it into an expert system. Depending on background and skill set, these roles could be handled by the same person. Or if you have a domain expert who also has experience with computer programming, they could fill in all these roles as well. In addition to a domain expert, a knowledge engineer, and a developer or programmer, the development team often also includes a project manager and an end user. The success of developing an expert system, of course, depends on how well these members work together. Anyone can be considered a domain expert if he or she has a deep knowledge of both facts and rules, and strong personal experience in a particular domain. In general, an expert is a skillful person who can do things that other people cannot. They have to be able to communicate their knowledge, think through their own internal knowledge and reasoning, and be able to participate and commit a substantial amount of time to the project. Then there's the knowledge engineer. This is somebody who's capable of designing, building, and testing an expert system. Their first job is to interview the domain expert to find out how a particular problem is solved. They establish what reasoning methods the expert uses to handle facts and rules and decides how to represent them in the expert system. The knowledge engineer is also usually responsible for choosing some development software or an existing expert system shell with which to build the expert system. They're also responsible for testing, revising, and integrating the expert system into the workplace. Ultimately, the knowledge engineer will work closely with both the domain expert and the end users. Next, we have the programmer. This is a person responsible for the actual programming, describing the domain knowledge in terms that a computer can understand. Often, they'll need symbolic programming skills, such as Lisp or Prolog. Also, some experience with expert system shells would be preferable, including something like Clips or Pyke. And certainly, they would also need conventional computer science experience in programming languages, such as C, Pascal, Java, Python, etc. The project manager is the leader of the expert system team, they're responsible for keeping the project on track and ensuring that all deliverables and milestones are met. They'll typically interact with all other members of the team. And then there's the end user. This is the person who uses the expert system once it's developed. The user must ultimately be confident in expert system performance and feel comfortable using it. The design of the user interface is a vital component of the project's success, especially for expert systems that are gonna be put into mainstream use. And so the user's contribution in terms of feedback can be crucial here. Now let's dive into the real meat of putting together an expert system. In particular, we're going to focus on knowledge acquisition and knowledge engineering. Knowledge acquisition is the extraction and formulation of knowledge derived from various sources, especially from human experts. This process usually takes 60 to 70 percent of the expert system development time. Knowledge can be acquired from human experts such as doctors, lawyers, engineers, investment analysts, or anyone who's a domain expert on the target problem. Knowledge can also come from other sources such as multimedia documents, textbooks, databases, research reports, and the web. The typical types of information that must be gleaned via knowledge acquisition are things like vocabulary or jargon, general concepts and facts, problems that commonly arise, the solutions to the problems that occur, and skills for solving particular problems. When we're conducting knowledge acquisition coming from an expert, the process is usually comprised of three principal stages. First is knowledge elicitation. This involves the interaction between the expert and the knowledge engineer to elicit the expert knowledge in some systematic way. The knowledge thus obtained is usually stored in some form of human-friendly intermediate representation. This is usually in the form of a flowchart or a semantic web or a tree or something like that as a way to organize the initial knowledge and start to think about how the expert system might need to be developed. We'll see an example of this later. Next we have knowledge engineering itself. Here the intermediate representation of the knowledge is then compiled into an executable form. So for example, production rules if we're creating a production expert system. This executable form has to be something that the inference engine can process. This process isn't always linear, and there can be many iterations of these steps. Again, this kind of process can be very time-intensive, thus 
automated knowledge elicitation and using machine learning techniques are becoming increasingly common modern alternatives to acquiring knowledge. One problem that knowledge engineers often encounter is that the human experts use tactic or implicit knowledge, in other words, procedural knowledge, which can be difficult to capture. As a result, there are several useful techniques for acquiring this kind of knowledge. The first is protocol analysis. Here we might tape record the expert thinking aloud while performing their role, and the knowledge engineer can later analyze this. This allows us to break down their protocol into the smallest atomic units of thought. Another strategy is participant observation. Here the knowledge engineer acquires tactic knowledge through practical domain experience alongside the expert. And the last is machine induction. This is useful when the experts are able to supply examples of the results of their decision making, even if they're unable to articulate the underlying knowledge or reasoning process. Picking the best strategy usually depends on the problem domain and the expert. If knowledge is to be acquired from other sources like databases or data sets or the web, we might need to go about information extraction. This is the process of extracting structured information from unstructured, machine-readable documents. This flowchart roughly illustrates the process of information extraction, starting from some source material. To get it into a format that the machine can actually process, we might need to go through stages of tokenization and normalization. So for example, maybe here we're trying to normalize the format that dates are stored in. We might have to conduct named entity recognition, where we're identifying named objects and looking for relevant information that surrounds it. Instance extraction, where we're looking for instances of an entity, such as Elvis. Fact extraction, where we use the identification of these instances and look for facts that are associated with those instances in the surrounding text. We can also try and organize this information in an ontological manner, and we can go even further in terms of the sophistication of our information extraction. A little more on named entity recognition. This is the process of finding entities, people, cities, organizations, and dates in text. So imagine we have this sentence in a document. Elvis Presley was born in 1935 in East Tupelo, Mississippi. The named entity recognition process looks for identifiable text entities. In this case, we have a name, a year, a city, and a state. Once we've identified named entities, we could also conduct relation extraction. So imagine we want to extract information about disease outbreaks from a document. We might first scan for named entities, such as dates, locations, and disease names, and then convert that raw text into a formatted set of variables. In this case, looking for dates where a specific disease appeared at a specific location. This can be automated by some kind of information extraction system, allowing us to grab the relevant information from the text and put it into our new database. Now let's talk about some of the levels of knowledge analysis. First, there's knowledge identification. Here we can use in-depth interviews in which the knowledge engineer encourages the experts to talk about how they do what they do. The knowledge engineer should understand the domain well enough to know which objects and facts need talking about. Then there's knowledge conceptualization. Here we want to find the primitive concepts and conceptual relations that are found in the problem domain. Next, we have epistemological analysis. Here we want to uncover the structural properties of the conceptual knowledge, such as a set of taxonomic relations. Next we can do logical analysis. Here we want to decide how to perform reasoning in the problem domain. This kind of knowledge can be particularly hard to acquire. And lastly, we can conduct implementational analysis, where here we want to work out the systematic procedures for implementing and testing the system. Stepping back, here is a schematic identifying the general stages of knowledge acquisition. Starting with identification, where we want to identify a problem's characteristics. Conceptualization, where we want to find the concepts to represent the knowledge. Formalization, where we want to design a structure to organize the knowledge. Implementation, where we want to formulate rules to embody knowledge. And testing, where we want to validate rules that organize the knowledge. We can see that this process can be somewhat cyclical as we refine the knowledge in the development of our expert system. So expert system construction used to be mostly a trial and error sort of approach placed in the hands of a knowledge engineer. Once that knowledge engineer had knowledge from the experts, they would fill in their knowledge base and basically just test it out and play with it until they got something that worked. By the end of the 80s, it was discovered that creating an actual domain model was the way to go. 
In other words, build a model of the knowledge before trying to implement anything. This model could be a dependency graph of what can cause what to happen, an association model, which is a collection of malfunctions, and the manifestations we would expect to see from those malfunctions. And it could also be a functional model, where component parts are enumerated and described by function and behavior. In more recent years, the emphasis on how to best go about building an expert system has shifted to using knowledge acquisition tools, usually in larger scale settings. A knowledge acquisition tool, or CADS, is a system that allows a domain expert to enter their knowledge as a graphical model that contains the component parts of the item being diagnosed or designed, as well as their functions and the rules for deciding how to diagnose or design each one. Here's a rough illustration of the knowledge base engineering cycle using CADS. So again, the expert provides some sort of conceptual model. So here we have an expert providing the model through a CADS approach. The knowledge engineer builds a knowledge base based on the domain model. Here the inference engine can be off the shelf or tailor made or some combination of the two based on the needs of the knowledge engineer. I'm not going to get into the details here, but basically this is a strategy to help automate the construction of an expert system. Now let's talk a bit more about making an intermediate representation as we go from knowledge acquisition to knowledge engineering of the actual expert system itself. Again, the intermediate representation is a structured representation of the knowledge, which is not yet in the form of code that can be put into an expert systems knowledge base. So for example, this could be problem decomposition into an and or graph like we've seen in earlier lectures. This is a convenient technique for reducing a problem into the elements required to build a production system. First, the principal goal is identified. It's split into two or more sub goals, and then these two are split up further. A simple graph of the goal and sub-goals is assembled, and each goal is written in a box called a node with its sub-goals underneath it joined by links. The leaf nodes at the bottom of the tree are the boxes at the bottom of the graph that don't have any links below them. These leaf nodes are going to be the pieces of data required to solve the problem. So let's go through an example of problem decomposition where we'll actually build an and or graph. We're going to start by placing a box at the top representing the goal in this case to advise the user of an investment or investment should be X. So now let's say we have three possible options for recommendations here. The investment could be in savings, stocks, or some mixture of the two. Perhaps the information we need to recommend putting it into savings is to check whether savings are inadequate. In other words, if they're inadequate, we should put more into savings. When it comes to stocks, we'll have to check two things because we have an and branch here indicated by the arc. So in this case, we'll recommend stocks if savings are adequate and income is adequate. Then for recommending a mixture of the two, we also want to check two options, whether savings are adequate and income is inadequate. We can continue to build the tree further to decide whether these nodes are true or false. So for example, we might check if income is inadequate by looking to see if the income is below some value W and whether the income is not steady. From this tree, we can now identify what will become production rules. So for example, this part of the tree, where we have the stock recommendation being based on whether savings is adequate and income is adequate. We can now say if both savings and income are adequate, then recommend stocks. Or over here, we can decide that income is inadequate if income is less than W and income is not steady. Further, we can conclude that savings is inadequate if the amount saved is less than Y. So ultimately, we can use this tree to identify all the production rules we'll need to make all the decisions required to recommend, in this case, what kind of investment a user should make. Now that we've talked about knowledge acquisition and a bit about problem decomposition, let's move further into knowledge engineering itself. Again, this is where we code the knowledge explicitly into a knowledge base that's going to be used by the expert system. So our first thought is how we want to implement the knowledge base. Maybe we want to use a declarative functional programming language such as Lisp, Prolog, or Miranda, as these are usually the first choice for implementing rule-based AI systems, such as expert systems, from the ground up. This is because the syntactic structure of the rules, as written in these languages, can be closely matched to a chosen form of knowledge representation, as well as the means by which a query is resolved to a related model of reasoning. A declarative program is a sequence of facts and rules 
as well as a set of conditions that describe a solution space. Here there is some dependence on the order in which these rules are written, but not nearly as much as in procedural programs. Differently, a procedural or iterative program consists of a sequence of commands. Here it's necessary for the programmer to think very carefully for each new problem about the steps that must be carried out in order to solve it and the order in which they must be done. Neural networks, as an example of a number crunching application, are typically implemented in procedural languages such as Java, C, or C++. In choosing an expert system development tool, we again want to consider the cost benefits, the technical functionality and flexibility of the tool, and the tool's compatibility with existing information infrastructure. We also want to consider the reliability of and support from a vendor if we're purchasing a piece of software to build an expert system. One major concern is whether the coding process is efficient and properly managed in order to avoid unnecessary errors. And then lastly, we're going to evaluate the system. There are two typical kinds of evaluation. The first is verification. This is basically checking that there's no error in the code and we achieve the same results as we would when acquired from an expert directly. The other kind of evaluation is validation, where we want to check that we've solved the problem correctly when applied to new test cases. A few other considerations for building an expert system is whether we have to worry about calculating certainty values or determining the priority of rules when they fire, what kind of conflict resolution mechanisms we might want to incorporate, and also if we have a system that's going to require some kind of truth maintenance system or TMS. A TMS can be useful if reasoning with defaults and beliefs is requested. Truth maintenance systems are also referred to as reason maintenance systems or belief revision systems. These basically maintain consistency between the old believed knowledge and current believed knowledge in the knowledge base. And it does this with constant more or less automated revision of the knowledge base. If the current believed statements contradict the knowledge in the knowledge base, then the knowledge base becomes updated with the new knowledge. In some AI courses, they spend a whole lecture on this topic, but here I'm just going to mention it so that you're familiar that these things exist. One word of warning is thinking about the potential for rule interactions. When you're attempting to expand an expert system by simply adding more rules, this can end up being dangerous to its functionality. Specifically, unexpected rule interactions are likely to happen. You might add new conflicts that need to be resolved or something along those lines. The need to consider all these possible rule interactions makes large rule-based systems unwieldy and hard to update. So while it might be easy to grasp the meaning of individual rules, it can be much more difficult to grasp the issues concerned with rule interactions. Lastly, once an expert system has been developed and put into use, it's still important to keep in mind that it might require some maintenance over the years. So even once developed, an expert system knowledge base must be continuously updated by adding, deleting, or changing rules to keep up with new knowledge and change circumstances. Maintenance might not be really important for all expert system problems, but for a lot of real-world applications, this is a serious thing to think about. Okay, at this point we're going to shift gears and learn about Pyke. First off, what is Pyke? Pyke stands for Python Knowledge Engine. It's basically an expert system interpreter and coding framework that we will use in this course to learn how to build and run a simple expert system. It integrates a form of logic programming into Python. And it provides an inference engine that applies rules to facts to establish additional facts through forwards chaining, or to prove goals by backwards chaining. Notably, Pyke can accommodate doing both backwards and forwards chaining at the same time. Further, Pyke can be used to optionally assemble Python functions into customized call graphs, which are called plans in Pyke. Here's a link with some more information about Pyke. Pyke is basically a really trimmed down expert system that really just focuses on storing a knowledge base of facts, a knowledge base of rules, and potentially a question base, as well, of course, as having an inference engine. But Pyke really doesn't have any accessory items such as a user interface. So why are we using Pyke in this course? Well, primarily Pyke was chosen because it operates exclusively in Python. And unlike another expert system language that I found called PyClips, this one works in Python 3. Um, this other expert system language called PyClips apparently only works in Python 2. So it's a bit out of date. 
Notably, however, the most commonly used expert system framework today is something called CLIPS. However, this is programmed in C coding language, and I wanted this course to incorporate some experience in using and coding Python. I do, however, recommend that if you're interested to please check out CLIPS. You don't actually need to know how to program in C in order to build an expert system in CLIPS. You just have to learn the basics of how to design rules and facts using the CLIPS interface, and you can pretty easily build your own expert system there. If you're really into the idea of building an expert system for a final project, definitely check out CLIPS as an option for building your own expert system. Here's a link to more information about CLIPS and where to download it. Notably, Assignment 3 is going to provide a lot of information that runs parallel to this part of our lecture, including how to install Pyke, how to open it up and use it within a Jupyter Notebook, and how to code your own expert system with examples. Along with the assignment file, I've created a Jupyter Notebook called BMIN 520 Pyke Installation and Family Relations Expert System Test. This Jupyter Notebook includes instructions on how to download and install Pyke and get it running on your computer and in Jupyter Notebook. Make sure to read through and run this notebook to make sure that you have things working properly. One of the first things to point out is that there are three kinds of Pyke source files. Files with the extension KFB define fact bases, files with the extension KRB define rule bases, and files with the extension KQB defined question bases. Example expert systems in Pyke will also include this file called driver.py. This is a critical file that will drive the expert system and we'll need to edit this whenever we're building our own or modifying our own expert system. Once you run through this Jupyter Notebook and install Pyke, it will have you try out your software using an example expert system based on family relationships that came with the Pyke software. Here, let's take a high-level look at the simplest way to use Pyke, or the essential components of making or running an expert system. All of these steps are going to look at the driver.py file initially. The first step in that file is to create an engine object. You'll see this command from Pyke import knowledge engine. This is loading in Pyke's built-in knowledge engine framework. Then you'll define your engine. For example, my engine equals knowledge engine dot engine file. Step two, you'll need to activate your rule bases. And you'll do this with the command my engine dot activate and the name of your rule base file. And lastly, you want to assign the goal to be proved. So here you'll start by loading in goal from Pyke. And then you'll define your goal. For example, my goal equals goal dot compile and then the name of your goal. All of what we just described takes place within this driver file, driver.py. As you'll see in the example Jupyter Notebook we just mentioned, one of the first things you'll do is import sys so that we can find the example expert system that came with Pyke, in this case, family relations. And I've used the path as it exists on my local computer to where we've installed Pyke and this family relations folder is located. So now your Jupyter Notebook knows where to look for Pyke and these other files that we'll need. Next, we're going to import driver. That's importing this driver.py piece of code. Here's what we might see inside driver.py. Up here, we're importing some of the important parts of Pyke, which you won't need to change. Here, we're defining our engine with the command you've already seen. Here, we're defining the goal, which we've seen before, but now we're adding a goal specific to our family relations expert system. In particular here, we're asking how person one and person two are related. Next, we define the test we want to conduct as a method. In this case, we're going to use forward chaining, and we're running a forward chaining test, so FC test. And in this case, we want to know Bruce's relationship to everyone else in our fact base. So we define person one as Bruce, but leave person two unspecified. Within this method, we then clean out the engine as a starting point using engine reset just a helpful thing to do to avoid errors in the future. Here we're tracking runtime. You won't need to play around with this, but that's the start time. And then we're activating our engine. This is basically running all applicable forward chaining rules. This part of the code down here is helping us return all of the findings of running the inference engine on the knowledge base. So here I've highlighted some of the key parts of this code, including the import statements, the defining of the knowledge engine, the defining of the goal, 
activating the engine to start running, and printing out the results of running the inference engine. In that first Jupyter Notebook, with the family relations example, we're first running a test, which calls driver.fctest with a specific name found within our fact base. When you run this command, you should get results that look like this. Specifically, through forward chaining, we're asking who Michael K is related to, and the output includes that Michael K and Amanda have a father-daughter relationship, Michael K and Tammy are also father and daughter, and Michael K and Crystal are father-daughter. We also get some additional information about how the expert system ran. In our next test cell, if we were to run this using my name, we'd basically get a blank output indicating that there were no relationships between me and anyone else in this particular expert system. That's because my name doesn't appear in this expert system. Therefore, no relationships could be found for me. Let's dive a little bit deeper into the knowledge base part of Pike. In particular, we're gonna look at fact bases and rule bases. As mentioned, the fact base stores facts in the form of a knowledge fact base or files with a KFB extension. As we've learned, there are two types of facts. One includes case-specific facts, which will be deleted when the inference engine is reset to prepare for another run of the inference engine. But then there are universal facts, which are never deleted and are always there and true. The rule base stores rules in the form of a knowledge rule base, or files with the .krb extension. Notably in Pike, a single rule base may contain both forward and backwards chaining rules. Pike uses a different syntax to represent either kind of rule to help distinguish them. And the last part of the knowledge base are question bases. These store questions for end users in the form of knowledge question bases or files with a KQB extension. These KQB files contain all the information needed to ask the question, validate an answer, and output the appropriate text for the user. Questions can be of various types. In other words, yes, no, true, false, multiple choice. Here's an example of what a question would look like in the question base. We've seen this one in our last lecture. We give the identifier for the question, the text that the user will see, and we delineate possible answers in terms of what kind of answers are possible. In this case, we have multiple choice and the user has to select one with these five being the options. In Pike, there's something called a statement, which is a generalized expression of knowledge or just something that is a fact. These statements have three components. The first is the name of the knowledge base. The second is the name of the knowledge entity, which might indicate the relationship between arguments. And then lastly, the arguments themselves. These can be any simple Python data value, including numbers, strings, none, true or false, or tuples of these values. The order of these arguments is critical and changing the order could change the meaning of the statement. So here's an example of a statement. In this case, in the knowledge base called family, there's a relationship or a knowledge entity called son of, and we have arguments here where some person's son is the son of this father and this mother. So within the fact base, this fact would look like this family.son of Bruce Thomas Norma, where Bruce is the son of Thomas, his father, and Norma, his mother. In order to conduct forward and backwards chaining, Pike uses pattern matching, which we've previously learned about. Notably, there are different kinds of patterns that can be used in matching. The first are simply literal patterns, as illustrated in red. These look exactly like the data or the facts themselves, and they can only match themselves. So Bruce can only match Bruce and Thomas only Thomas. These serve as inputs to Pike, and they're used when asking, is statement X true? Then there are pattern variables. These serve as output parameters. For instance, we have dollar sign sun here in yellow. These pattern variables always start with a dollar sign, and they serve as output parameters. A pattern variable can either be bound to a value, uh, i.e. a literal pattern, or they can be left unbound. So we can use this to ask a more general question, such as who are the sons of Thomas and Norma? So in this case, we're not looking for a specific son, but to find all sons of Thomas and Norma. And then lastly, we can have anonymous pattern variables as illustrated here in blue. These always start with a dollar sign and then an underscore, and they're never bound to values. These can be used when asking something like who are Norma's sons when we don't care which specific father value is used. So perhaps Norma had sons from different fathers. 
and we want to be able to find all of them. Now let's shift gears to Pike rules. Rules in Pike have two parts, the if part and the then part. As we, as we know, the if part contains a list of statements called the premises, and the then part contains a list of statements called the conclusions. Each of these if and then parts contain one or more facts or goals. So for example, if A and B and C, then D and E, or just then D. In order to make the rule succeed, Pike tries to match all the statements with facts within the if clause through a process called backtracking. So imagine we have a rule if A and B and C, then some conclusion. When processing the list of premises, A, B, and C in this graph, the values of this rule are checked via a backtracking process, where we start with the first, check if it succeeds, and then move on to the next and the next, and if it fails, it goes backwards. If the first premise of a rule succeeds, then we proceed down to the next one, where we're trying to proceed down all the way to the last premise in the list, and in this case, the rule succeeds. If we fail to prove a premise along the way, we go back up to the prior premise in the list and try to find another solution for it. This basically illustrates how the agenda gets built within side Pike. If we end up having to back up from the first premise in the list when it fails, this causes the whole rule to fail. Now let's look at the syntax of forward chaining rules in Pike. The first thing to note is that Pike uses for each assert rather than the text if then. Forward chaining in Pike proceeds as you might expect. The first step, Pike starts with the if clause of the first rule and checks to see if it matches the known facts. If it does, it proceeds to the then clause of that rule, firing the rule to assert a new fact. These new facts may fire other forward chaining rules by matching their if clause. This process keeps going until no more rules could be fired. Differently, backwards chaining rules in Pike use the syntax use when rather than then if. So backwards chaining rules are actually written in Pike starting with the conclusion and then moving to the if part of the rule. Backwards chaining in Pike also proceeds as you might expect. Pike starts by finding a rule whose then part matches the goal. Then Pike tries to prove all the sub goals in the if part of that rule, where some of these sub goals can be matched against facts and others are matched with the then part of other backwards chaining rules. If all of the sub goals can be proven, the rule succeeds, and the original goal is proven. Otherwise, the rule fails, and Pike tries to find another rule, and so on. All right, now that you're armed with the basics of Pike and how to code rules and facts in a Pike expert system, let's look at our first of two specific examples. In this case, we're going to look at the family relations example that came with the Pike software. So the family relations example uses forward chaining for the rules in its rule base. Facts for this expert system are stored in the file family.kfb, and they take the form of something that looks like this, son of variable son, variable father. A way of interpreting this fact is that the first person is the son of the second person. So if we actually look inside the file family.kfb, we'll see entries like this. David is son of Bruce, Bruce is son of Thomas, Thomas is son of Frederick. Now let's say we want to derive father-son relationships in the following form. Father-son, where we have father, son, and some kind of prefix. Here, son is the name of the son, for example, David. Father is the name of the father, for example, Bruce. And prefix is a tuple of prefixes before father and son titles to indicate the number of generations. So for instance, you get an empty tuple for direct father relationships, or you get grand for like grandfather relationships. Now let's look at some of the rules in this example expert system. They're stored here in a knowledge base called FC example KRB. These are forward chaining rules for this family relationship expert system example. If you look inside this file, we'll see some rules that look something like this one and like this one. Recall that forward chaining rules take the form of if then statements where if is replaced by for each and then is replaced by assert. So instead we have a rule titled direct father son. Its condition is that within the fact-based family one, if you have a relationship son of son father, then we can conclude the fact father son relationship where we have father son and then some prefix. You don't need to know all the details here. The, the most important thing is to know what a rule looks like in general within the Pike framework. 
So let's take a closer look at some of these forward chaining rules in this example. We'll start with the rule we just saw, direct father-son. So first we want to establish any direct father-son relationship. In other words, relationships where this prefix is just going to be empty because it's not a grandfather or a stepfather or anything like that. So here's that rule, direct father-son that we've just seen. And here are some facts that are included in the fact base of this example. Looking at our first fact in family one, we see that this son of format will match this part of the rule. To make it completely match, we're going to instantiate these values with the ones found in this fact. So in other words, we're going to replace son with David and father with Bruce. Because we've instantiated these values, they'll also be replaced down here in the then part of the rule. And so now we have a new fact being added that is father, son, Bruce, David. Because we have a match, this rule gets triggered or fired, and we now add this fact to our fact base giving us this value. Because we have some other facts here, this rule will end up firing at least these three more times because it'll match these instances. We'll have three additional new facts with different bindings added to the knowledge base. Here are the four new facts in total that we'll get by this rule triggering based on these facts in the knowledge base. In this family relations example, there's also a set of backwards chaining rules that can be used alternatively. Here's what some of these rules look like. Let's focus on the same rule we just saw in forward chaining, now in the backwards chaining format. Notice now that the then part is first and the if part is second, where then is now replaced with use and if is replaced with when. So use this when this is true. So the only difference between forward and backwards chaining rules in Pike is the order of the if and then components and the use of distinct keywords, in this case use or when, based on whether you're doing forwards or backwards chaining. Take some time to look at some of these other examples and try and understand the relationship that each rule is describing. Now let's take a closer look at an example of using backwards chaining using this family example. Here we're going to start with a fact base labeled family2.kfb. And here are some facts in that fact base. So now let's say we want to know who Fred's nephews are. So we might ask of the expert system, uncle, nephew, Fred, some nephew, some prefix. So since we're doing backwards chaining, we want to first find a rule whose part matches the goal. So again, our goal is uncle, nephew, Fred, nephew prefix. So the first rule that's found by the inference engine is this one. Notice that the then part of the rule matches our goal. Because our goal has instantiated the value of Fred, this rule will also similarly instantiate that value. And similarly, it'll get instantiated in the if part of the rule below. So now in order to prove this goal, we need to prove all of these if components. So our first sub goal to be proven is brothers, Fred, father. So let's walk through proving this first sub goal. Again, our sub goal is brothers, Fred, father. And our inference engine will look for another rule that matches this format. In this case, we find one where our sub goal, brothers, Fred, father, matches the then part of this backwards chaining rule, brothers, variable brother one, variable brother two. Again, Fred will be instantiated in the brother one position, and further it will be instantiated in the if part of the rule, wherever we see brother one. So now we need to proceed further and try and prove all of the if parts of this rule. So now our sub goal to be proven is father, son, variable father, Fred. So now let's try and prove this sub goal. And we look for a rule that has the then part of the rule matching this sub goal. This is what we find. And so now Fred gets instantiated again. And it also gets instantiated in the if part of the rule. Notice that this part of the backwards chaining rule is looking at information from our fact base coming from family two. So now we check our fact base to see if we have something that matches this expression. And in fact, we find son of Fred Thomas, where Fred matches specifically and Thomas matches the variable father. 
and to get Thomas to match the variable father, we instantiate it here. At this point, we've succeeded in improving at least this branch of steps in the inference chain. However, there were some other conditions and some of the other rules we'd still need to satisfy in order to prove our original goal. However, we'll leave the backwards chaining example here just to move on to another example. Here we turn to a really simple weather example that I've encoded and included along with assignment three. I've given this expert system the name simple backwards chaining all. In addition to the original Jupyter Notebook that I mentioned that gives instructions for installing Pike and testing out that it works properly, I've coded a second Jupyter Notebook included with assignment three called Beeman 520 Pike Coding Simple Example. This will walk you through this weather expert system. And this serves as a very simple set of code to provide a template for how you can create your own backwards chaining expert system. This weather expert system specifically decides what you should bring when walking out of the house. In other words, an umbrella, a raincoat, or nothing. Again, you'll find the files for this expert system in a zip folder called Simple BC All. In the Jupyter Notebook I've provided, you'll first see this initial command. Again, pointing the notebook to where this expert system folder is located. You will, of course, need to change this to the unique path to where it's located on your own computer. And this weather expert system, we've renamed the driver file to driver underscore simple. And so we'll need to import that here. Right off the bat, when you run this cell, a method in driver simple called BC test will be run, and you should see this output. If we look at the driver simple file, we'll see very similar code as we saw in the family relations example, where we first import the necessary packages, initialize the engine, and then we have a method for BC test, with which we've run above. Here we activate the engine, pointing it to the appropriate rule file that I've created for this initial example, and I identify the goal. In this case, what do I bring with me? If we look at the fact base and rule base for this simple expert system, we'll see the following hard-coded facts. It is raining and it is windy. And here are the rules again using a backwards chaining format where we have the then part of the rules first and the if part second. So in this case, we have the rule wear rain protection. So if it is raining, then we're gonna use rain protection. Another rule, what to bring raincoat. If we need rain protection, if we've already determined that's true, and one of our facts is that it's windy, then we'd recommend to bring a raincoat. We also define a rule for when to bring an umbrella and when to bring nothing. Going back for a moment, running this first BC test method will just load in the established preloaded facts and see what prediction the system will output. So in this case, we got the recommendation to bring a raincoat. If we look what facts were encoded in the knowledge base, we said that it was rainy and it was windy. The rule for bringing a raincoat would only be triggered if it was windy and we required rain protection, and we only, need, and we only know we needed rain protection if it was raining. So we can see that the recommendation to bring a raincoat was the correct output we expected given these starting facts. Furthermore, in this example expert system, I've programmed another method that's also located within driver simple called bc underscore test underscore questions. Instead of hard coding facts, this version of the experts asks the user directly for facts based on questions that you've pre-written. So when I run this, I'll see this series of questions appear that you have to add values for. So first it'll ask, is it raining? And I typed Y for yes. Then it'll ask, is it windy? And I typed Y for yes. And as a result, I should get the response, you should bring an umbrella. Just for fun, I added another additional question, are any of the following disasters currently occurring? And depending on the value you put in, it'll give you a different recommendation of what else you should bring in addition to your rain gear. Here's the method bc underscore test questions that's located in driver simple. Notice it looks very similar to the other examples, but now it points to a different rule base that makes use of the questions in the question base. Here on the left, we have some of the questions in our question base, and on the right, we have the rules that are programmed in our special rule base that utilizes these questions. So first, in looking at the questions, we can see that question format that I mentioned before. So for example, is it raining? Variable answer, 
Here's the text the user will see, and then the type of response required from the user. In this case, yes, no. And up here, we have select one or multiple choice, and then you can specify the options. Over here on the right, we have our set of rules, all written in the backwards chaining format in Pike. Again, where we have use when or then if formatting. So let's take apart our first rule here, no rain. It's saying if questions is raining false, then what to bring is no rain gear. So the question part of the rule is calling questions or which is the name of the question base that we've entered in. Then it's identifying the question is raining and grabbing and seeing if the user response value is equal to false. If that's true and the user did say false to if it's raining, then the use part of this rule is satisfied and we know that our response should be no rain gear. We can see similarly structured rules for what to bring raincoat and what to bring umbrella. For the multiple choice questions like what to bring marshmallows, we get the response to the multiple choice question, any disasters from over here. In this case, if the answer is one or a forest fire, then we know that our conclusion what to bring marshmallows is true. In another example, what to bring kite, we again ask for the answer to the any disasters question but now we check if the value is either two or three, which would be a tornado or a hurricane. If either of those situations is true, then we know that what to bring kite is gonna be true. And our response will be to bring a kite. Okay, so at this point, we've gone over Pike as an expert system shell and development tool. And we've gone through a couple examples of how it's used in practice. As part of assignment three, I ask you to look through these different expert systems very carefully to try and understand how they work and then you'll have the opportunity to program your own basic expert system as part of assignment three. It'll be really useful to use this weather example in particular as a model for building your own expert system. Notably there's a lot of flexibility in Pike and you can do a lot more with the inside of these rules than what you've seen in this lecture. If you want to explore this further definitely check out the Pike website link that I included at the beginning of this lecture and is included in assignment three. So today we've talked about some of the development roles for building an expert system. We've talked in detail about knowledge acquisition and engineering and this whole process. And we've learned about Pike and gone through the two examples that we just mentioned, the family relations example and the very simple weather example that I coded up. Here's today's quote. If it squirms, it's biology. If it stinks, it's chemistry. If it doesn't work, it's physics. And if you can't understand it, it's mathematics. Just a reminder that our next class session, you'll be giving your midterm paper presentations. And at this point in our module on expert systems, you should have most everything you need to complete assignment three. I definitely recommend you dive into this as soon as possible, as this is the most challenging of the four assignments in this course. Check your syllabus for the due date of the midterm presentation and assignment three. As always, thank you for your attention and I'll see you in the next lecture.